Good. Welcome to True Health Tuesdays. Tonight we're talking about prostates. Now, I am the definitive expert because I've owned one for 56 years. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that bad. Okay. Okay. When we look at it, we're going to go over the anatomy and physiology, but understand prostates are designed to last a lifetime. The reason our society has such troubles with it is because of two things, misdiagnosis and a misunderstanding. Now, we're going to cover, cover the anatomy. Now, first, it's about the size of a walnut. Now, its main job, because uh, vaginal areas or vaginal environments are very acidic. So this alkalinizes and protects the sperm, and this allows the sperm to survive to get to the egg. Now, when we look at it, I want you to, to own this anatomy. When you look at this cross section, you're looking at the rectum, which is right behind uh, the prostate. So does, think of this. You've got a stool or a bowel movement right behind the, the prostate. So every time good, healthy stool formation, you're actually massaging that prostate or getting blood flow to it. Now, it's also, if we look at this, and this is the pelvic floor. When we look at this, isn't, this is an example of a male and how do you know it's a male? Because this thing here is shaped like a martini glass. Okay, if it was a female, it'd be round and it'd look like a margarita glass. So, you know, if you're curious, you're watching CSI and they misdiagnose or they say, no, the body is a male. And you go, no, baby, that's a margarita glass. Okay, okay, so it'd be like one up on them. Okay, but, but this right here, I want you to look at it, that the pelvic floor this area here is like a, almost a trampoline of muscles. And that muscles, they attach on the inside around here. Now you sit on these bones here. They're called the ischial tubes or the sit bones. When you sit on that, that can open up and spread out the pelvis. So you're gonna see that sedentary lifestyles or lack of exercise literally spreads that out. And it's almost like if you if you look at those muscle fibers, where a muscle, if it's shortened up and the fibers are in contact, it's stronger. If the muscle fibers are stretched out or they weaken. So an, an ex, a pelvic floor that's expanded out is completely weak. Now, when we look at this, the rectum or relationship to the prostate, you're gonna see that between the rectum and the base of the penis, that area of the prostate, that walnut sized organ is right next to the skin. <clears throat> this also means that when we talk about prostate massage and moist heat, because think of this, if we're able to directly stimulate that prostate with massage, if we're able to directly stimulate that with heat, if we're able to strengthen the muscles and help the nerves that supply that area, it's going to be a healthy area. Do, do, does that make sense? The problem is with, in our society, this is like taboo. You know, you can't mention this. Okay, oh, he said penis. Okay, yeah. Okay, am I the only teenager here? Okay, okay. but, but you understand that, that it's hard to approach this from, from an anatomy and physiology standpoint. But I want you to do that because when we talk about prostate massage and heat and therapies in that area, it, it all evolves and revolves around the nerve supply and the structures in the area. We're also going to talk about some supplements that will help too. Now, when we look at this, we can't leave the girls out. The girls have a similar gland. It's called the Skeen's gland. And this is, if you've ever heard of female ejaculants, this is, it's like the female prostate gland. We're not going to go into it, but just since we're talking about 50% of our audience here, you gals are included now too. Okay, you, you don't have a real prostate that swells up, okay, but it, but it is similar, it does it is secrete fluid. Now when we look at the nerve supply to it, this is vital. Now the structure up there is the sacrum, and that's the bone on the back of the spine, right at, you can see where that pelvic floor is. Now the nerves that come out of here, S stands for sacrum, and so the S2, S3, and S floor, actually supply the pelvic floor. Now, <clears throat> they're also involved in not just the pelvic floor, but in climax, arousal, and sexual function. So how do you remember stuff? You remember C3, C4, C5 keeps you alive, that's the nerve to the diaphragm. S2, 3, 4 keeps the ding-dong off the floor. <laughs> <clears throat> No, seriously, when I'm teaching the boards, this is exactly what I taught. 
So if you thought, you know, erectile dysfunction, sexual dysfunction, prostatitis, okay, what part of the anatomy or what part of the nervous system is affected? Which part? S2, 3, and 4. It works! Okay, don't knock it. Okay, so <clears throat> we have to look at the autonomic nervous system. Now, this is more important than anything you could possibly imagine. When you're diagnosing and assessing what a problem is, you have to look at how the body um, functions. And this is also called the automatic nervous system. Now, we've got two parts, fight or flight, which keeps you alive under stress. Okay, it also has certain functions because you need this fight or flight to function during the day and the other part is rest, digest, and repair. Now the fight or flight is also called thoracolumbar. So it's actually an anatomical structure located in this area. The cranial sacral, or the parasympathetic, is located here and here. Oh, the sacral, that's that S2, 3, and 4. So we're looking at the parasympathetic nerve supply is also vital for supplying that area. Does, does that make sense? Now since it's located here, and we know a sedentary lifestyle can put pressure on the ischial tube, does that mean that people with a sedentary lifestyle are going to have autonomic nervous system dysfunction? Absolutely. And then when you look at this, these two nervous systems are so intimately involved in function, it's vital. So when we look at parasympathetic nervous system, that's the growth and repair. The sympathetic nervous system keeps you alive under stress. Um, you can also say point and shoot. Parasympathetic is responsible for arousal. Sympathetic is shooting is responsible for the climax. So now think of this, and, and this is so frustrating in our society today. How many people are able to get aroused but not climax? Okay, so is that a dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system? Absolutely. How many people are missing the arousal? Okay, so they're not even able to start. And it's only because of sedentary lifestyle because that autonomic nervous system is dysfunctional. Can you see why, I mean, when there's ever any type of pelvic dysfunction, man, we'd look at this right away. Now, the nervous system controls not just the smooth muscles, but it controls all the function and the pelvic floor. So when we look at this, um, on the pelvic floor, any nerve compression or sedentary lifestyle is going to open up that, that area and weaken it. And this is why, I mean, if, if somebody comes in with prostate issues, bowel issues, bladder issues, we're going to look at the state of the pelvis. Now, this is important because there's actually no muscle that crosses the back half of that joint. And so if you've ever been diagnosed or heard of, has anyone ever heard of piriformis syndrome? Okay, well this is a really common um, misdiagnosed problem where the only muscle that crosses that joint crosses on the front. And if it's always in spasm, it's indicating that this joint is unstable as well. So there's a lot of misdiagnosis and like, like almost urban legends. Now, when we look at this, the three main prostate problems, and we're talking prostatitis, that's just inflammation of the prostate, benign prostatic hypertrophy, and we're going to go over cancer as well, but we're going to look at these three main causes, or three main conditions. Now, when we look at prostatitis, now, of the prostatitis cases, over 95%, or 90 to 95% are chronic. Now, the medical theory is that this is from some kind of bacterial infection. Now, it's interesting because they're not really identifying a lot of bacteria that's in that, even though it's close to the rectal area. But they're saying, well, it must be. It must be some type. So, when you look at it, do we have bacteria as part of our normal flora, our normal situation. Yeah, it's really common. So a lot of times they're looking at an inflammation has a defense mechanism. But now what kind of things can actually damage that prostate to cause inflammation? Could a sedentary lifestyle stretching out those muscles cause a lack of nutrients to get to the prostate? Mm -hmm. Yes or yes? yes? Absolutely. So inflammation is actually how the body tears down and builds up. So when I hear inflammation, I think of not just a response to infection, but it's also a problem where tissue is breaking down and the body's trying to build it back up. So the medical doctors are suspecting it's bacteria, but one of the main causes, and you're going to see all three of them, the benign prostatic hypertrophy, prostatitis, and cancer, all have a similar effect. 
we've got a bladder up here and the prostate surrounds the urethra. And if that prostate swells up, you can see how it limits it. So a lot of people, you know, men will say, well, I have difficulty in urination, difficulty in evacuating my bowel. I feel like I got to go all the time and I go to the restroom and I can't, there's no force in the stream. So this can all indicate that there's some kind of pressure on that urethra. Now, benign prostatic hypertrophy. This is another easy mnemonic. 50% of men over 50, 60% of men over 60, 80% of men over 80 are going to have it in this country. So now we have to start thinking, well, what's dysfunctional there? What's causing it? Do people become more active as they retire the way they should? Or do they become more sedentary? We're also going to, more sedentary, but we're also going to see that drugs have to play in this. And this is a non-cancerous enlargement of the prostate. And the, the most frustrating thing, it's the most common disorder. And we're talking 50% of men over in my age group. And again, it has a similar, similar appearance where we have the bladder and it's swollen up. So it's going to be almost exactly the same symptoms. And so remember, because I want you to remember that anatomy of the first part. We've got the rectum that goes behind this. We've got the pelvic floor underneath it. So if it's swollen, do you think that if you were to get blood flow to it, stimulate that area, allow health, do you think that prostate may start to return to normal? Yes or yes? Ab absolutely, yeah. It, and now, let's look at prostate cancer. Now this is, does anybody remember the, the it, I think it was a movie s a series, Sybil? It was a gal that had like multiple personalities. Yeah. Okay, well, when you look at the research, you're thinking, my God, these doctors have multiple personalities. One says it's dangerous, one says it's not. One says it's bad, one says, I mean, so when we look at this, let's look at, the, at the, the real bipolar disorder that's in the medical world. Most common form of cancer, prostate cancer, affects one in six um, American men. Sixth leading cause of death, 99% of those cases occur in men over 50. Baby, I'm 56, it ain't happening in me. Okay, and half of those, okay, um, of the people 50 to 59 have it. Now, then you look at this. Okay, so now that sounds really bad, right? Okay, let's look at the other part. Um, it can develop painful and fatal, but according to the medical journals, uh, most medical journals, the majority of prostate cancer will never progress to a clinically meaningful stage if left undiagnosed and untreated during a man's lifetime. Wait a second, okay, sixth leading cause of cancer death worldwide affects one in six males, uh, American males. However, if it's undiagnosed and untreated, it won't be clinically significant ever. Okay, so, so, okay, good, thank God. Okay, I, I'm not getting it either. Okay, so we're gonna go, yeah, it, it better be scratching your head, okay? Because when we look at the research, the research is gonna make it even get crazier. Now, they used to call prostate cancer high-grade prosthetic intraepithelial neoplasia. Now, this was considered prostate cancer for years. As of 2013, it's no longer considered prostate cancer. Okay, d does anyone know what d WTF means? Does it WTF mean the same thing in England? Yeah. <laughs> okay, good, just checking. It's like, wait a second, what if I was diagnosed with prostate cancer, had it removed, had major radiation pellet therapy, had all this stuff, and I found out that a few, a few years later, it never would have caused a problem in the first place. Now, according to the National Cancer Institute, these are now considered, now, considered benign indolent lesions of the epithelial origin and should never have been and should never be termed carcinomas. Okay, now, again, this is the third of the same slide, but I want you to own this, that we've got the bladder, we've got the kidneys, we've got the ureters, and that prostate surrounds the urethra. So any swelling of that area, okay, it's going to have a similar symptom. 
Now, when we look at symptoms of prostate problems, I mean, obviously, we're going to look at difficulty in urination, frequent urination, um, night urination, uh, urgency, leaking, dribbling, weak stream, pain in the abdomen and groin, painful orgasms, because it's all in that floor. So if that area is swollen up, we're going to have all of these symptoms. So now, what's the test? The one test that ha people have come up with to go over this. It's called prostate-specific antigen, or PSA test. Now, PSA stands for prostate-specific antigen. Now, <clears throat> survey says, would that be specific to the prostate? No kidding, that's the friggin' name, right? Well, it's not. <laughs> okay, <laughs> now, the, it, it, this is like the primary thing that they use to screen for prostate cancer. So the theory is that cancer cells secrete more of this PSA or prostate-specific antigen. However, according to the Journal of National Cancer Institute, PSA is found in females with breast and lung and uterine cancers. In fact, the highest levels are found in people that have been fe females recovering from breast cancers. Wait, we got that Sybil thing going again? <laughs> where it's specific to the prostate, but it's high in women who are recovering from this? So let's look at this a little bit more. So is this an industry now? Sure enough, uh, when the PSA is high, a biopsy is usually done. Now the biopsy is more painful. So right now, you know how if you're coming up to a scary part in a movie, it'll cover your kid's eyes? Okay, if there's a man sitting next to you, please cover his eyes. Because imagine, 6 to 20, and I know this, this slide says 12, but we just had a guy 21 samples on his prostate, shoving a needle into that sensitive area right behind the penis, right in front of the rectum, okay, in there to get a, a hollow gauge needle samples. Now, you're, you're laying down on the table for 45 minutes. Now, there's a couple of ways to do it. One we have transrectally. Well, they actually go into the rectum, and a needle going through the wall of the rectum into the prostate. I know what you're thinking. How could this possibly be bad? <laughs> I'm thinking the same thing too. You know, it's not like it's a bacteria-filled environment and we're going in and breaking a nice wall. It's it's like, are you serious? Good God, bring the leeches back. Okay, so so this thing jamming it up there, that's one method. Uh, that's not, not good enough. Well, we can stick a tube down the inside of your penis and we'll cut little holes out of the prostate. Okay, of course you might be thinking, well, my gosh, doesn't urine flow there and you're breaking the integrity of the bladder wall and then you're, you're actually carving out some. So th there could be some, some negatives to that. And then we have this ultrasound guided needle. I mean, that sounds kind of like a cruise missile. So you have this probe that goes in the rectum, and then you have this needle that goes through. Again, that peritoneum, okay, going in, you know, in, in that, that area, and you're, you're taking the, the tissue, you're taking, do you, do you understand it's not, it, it's, you're, and you're getting this needle coming out with cells, and then you're putting it under a microscope, and it's not, an, an organ that doesn't have blood vessels or anything. It has blood vessels. It's an extra, extra organ. This is important. Now, this is a major industry, major industry. And so when we look at this, the controversy, $3 billion a year, PSA screening tests for prostate are controversial because of the cost and uncertain long-term benefits to the patients. False positive, false negatives. Here's the guy that developed the test, Richard Alblin. I never dreamed that my discovery four decades ago would lead to such a profit-driven public health disaster. Okay, the test is hardly more effective than a coin toss. Now, when we look at this, the American Urological Association, the controversy over prostate cancer should not surround the test. Yeah, don't look at the test, please. But rather, the test, how the test influenced decisions to treat. A cancer cannot be treated if not detected. Uh, testing empowers the patients and their urologist with information to make an informed decision. Okay, there's the Sybil part. Now, Dr. Thomas Stamey, who published one of the original articles in 1987, our study raises, now this is 1987, a very serious question whether a man should even use the PSA test for prostate cancer screening. 
I have removed a couple hundred prostates I wished I hadn't. Now, it, here's a patient of mine. Now, I, I changed his name to Robert. But if you ever saw this dynamic, healthy guy coming in from bike riding, I mean ripped, strong, dynamic, 76-year-old guy. Okay, this is, he's normal. But when he was 65, he had a high PSA test, and we know the value of that is worthless right now, or actually dangerous, it's less than worthless. They removed his prostate. Now, you can have sexual dysfunction, you can have bladder dysfunction, you can have bowel dysfunction, all from having it removed. But he made the decision to get it removed because he had a high PSA test, and he wanted to live, baby, and not die of prostate cancer. Even though, according to the research, you'll probably, if you get prostate cancer, it won't kill you, okay? Ten years later, in 75, and this happened last year, he goes to the oncologist for a standard checkup and they said, wow, your PSA test is through the roof. And, and he goes into the oncologist and says, I don't have a prostate. You told me that this would never be a problem. Well, we've learned some things in the past. Yeah. And so he comes to me and I said, buddy, how did you not punch this guy? <laughs> you know, 10 years of, of urinary problems and, and sexual dysfunction for something that never needed to be done. Okay, well, I mean, it's, it's interesting because he said, what should I do? And I said, nothing. It's a bullpucky test. Strengthen your immune system, so get on some fish oils. And, you know, I'm going to show you all the stuff, even though he didn't have a prostate, just strengthen your immune system and it'll be fine. Now, here's the United States Preventative Task Force when they're talking about the PSA test. Uh, Prostate-specific antigen-based screening results in small or no reduction in prostate cancer-specific mortality and is associated with harms subsequent to evaluation and treatments of some of which may be unnecessary. Yeah, is anybody still sore from me describing the needle going into the <laughs> prostate? Okay, I told you cover your eyes, didn't I? Okay, okay, so American Society of Clinical Oncology. It's uncertain whether the benefits of associated with PSA testing for prostate scans or screening are worth the harms associated with screening and the subsequent unnecessary treatments. I mean, when you look at the American Cancer Society doesn't support testing for prostate cancer at this time. So if your oncologist is doing it, they're not following the data. They're following some agenda. When we look at the chief medical officer for the American Cancer Society, um, the question is not as simple as prostate cancer screening work. We need to know what are the benefits of cancer screening and are they large enough to outweigh the harms with it. We still cannot say whether the benefits outweigh the risks. Outweigh the risk of stabbing that prostate, you know, a dozen or more times. Now, the New England Journal of Medicine, screening did not reduce the death of cancer rates in men 55 and older. Most men with an elevated PSA test turn out to not have prostate cancer. Only 25% of the men who had a prostate biopsy due to an elevated PSA actually have prostate cancer. And what do they say about prostate cancer anyway? It's not going to be a problem. Heck, if you had the high-grade intraepithelial neoplasm, can anyone say that three times really fast? <laughs> Okay, yeah, I want a little accolades here. It's hard to get my tongue to work this way. Okay, so it, it, that's, that's no longer cancer. And then you look at this, the European Randomized Control Study, 182,000 men. Okay, and we're talking nine years. And they found out that if, or to save one life, to prevent one death from prostate cancer, you had to screen almost 1,500 men. And that means putting a needle biopsy, putting it through, damaging all the prostates. Do you think that's going to cause prostatitis, shoving a needle in there 12 to 15 times? Mm -hmm. Maybe a little bacterial infection. A little, it, it, what about just worrying, you know, that you got some kind of prostate issues? What's that going to do to the immune system? Okay, and then after the 1,500 people, they maybe you'll find 48 cases, and maybe they're going to save one. Okay, instead of, instead of, I know this is a bizarre idea, but taking that 1,500 men that they screened, okay, and instead of shoving needles into their prostates to look for a biopsy, what if we do things to make their pelvic support healthy? What if we check their nervous system? What if we actually help them? 
Journal of the American Medical Association, 2009. After 20 years of screening for breast and prostate cancer, several observations can be made. The screening may increase the burden of low-risk cancers without significantly reduce the burden of more aggressive growing cancers and therefore not resulting in the anticipated reduction in cancer mortality. To reduce morbidity and mortality from prostate cancer and breast cancer, new approaches for screening, early detection, and prevention for both diseases should be considered. No kidding! Look at the friggin' nervous system. Look at the structures. Look at the, the toxic exposure to the patient. I mean, that should be like, duh. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm a little passionate because I have a prostate. Okay, so <laughs> cholesterol drugs. Could this be linked to prostate issues? Yeah, look at the data. It's all over the place. Okay, one in six men are having prostate issues, American men. One in four are taking a drug that causes it. So, <laughs> honestly, you know, I mean, does this sound like a Benny Hill episode? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Okay, okay, so it blocks a crucial enzyme in the liver, okay? It, that also makes coenzyme Q. So this means that statins are linked to heart problems. I know there, you know, there's over 900 studies that show that statins are dangerous, but when we look at the data, okay, we're talking the Journal of the American Medical Association, and I'm sorry about the wordiness of this, but, but when you look at it, each word is so valuable and it's a pain in the butt to read each one, but by God, I want you to have the actual data that your doctor should have, but because he's ignorant and lazy, he doesn't have it. If he had the gumption to actually look at the data, people would be saved. So when we look at this, connection between statin drugs and the development of various cancers, not just prostate. Long-term clinical trials and careful post-marketing surveillance during the next several decades are needed to determine whether cholesterol-lowering drugs cause cancer in humans. That was 1996. Um, in the meantime, the results of the experiments in animals and humans suggest that lipid-lowering treatments, especially with the fibrates and statins, should be avoided. That was in 1996. <coughs> Evidently, nobody read this one. <laughs> There are currently no evidence that a statin medication which reduces levels of low-density lipoprotein cholesterol improves clinical outcomes has, such as myocardial infarction or death. So what it's designed to do is prevent heart attacks and death, and there's no evidence that it does, but we do know that it's linked to cancers. Now, why? Cholesterol is the precursor, it's the building block to every hormone you make. We're talking testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, um, cortisol, adrenaline, I mean everything. This is the building block for every glucocorticosteroid, medicocorticosteroid, and sex hormone. Uh, this is the, the, the most vital component ever. Now let's say you take a cholesterol-lowering drug. Now the testes produced um, um, testosterone, but also the adrenal glands do. Let's say you're taking a cholesterol-lowering drug. So what happens if you have low testosterone? Now, um, testosterone, it's a hormone communication between organs and tissues. Um, testosterone is responsible for regulation of the prostate. Wow, so maybe if you take it, it, so it wouldn't be good. So one in four Americans taking a drug that can negatively affect the prostate of one in six Americans. Yeah. <laughs> ma males, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, then we'll give them Viagra too. <laughs> You're such a marketer. Okay. <laughs> Okay, sperm development. How many, have you seen the fertility clinics in our society? Mm -hmm. I mean, in the 60s, they were talking about, good God, please don't get the girls pregnant. Now it's like, how do, how do you do it? Okay, cognitive and physical energy, regulation, tissue healing, bone healing, cardiovascular health. I mean, when we're talking about low levels of testosterone, Diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's, stroke, heart attacks, depression, sleep disorders, reduced sex drive, erectile dysfunction. I, I mean, it, it's, it's crazy. If you have normal testosterone or above testosterone, what do you got? You got increased mental activity, sexual vitality, improved immune system, lower blood pressure, decreased heart attack, obesity, body mass, diabetes, bone mass. I mean, decreased risk of dementia. And this is all the Journal of Neurology and the Journal of American Medical Association. So healthy levels of testosterone are good. I mean, not from a testosterone supplement. Because if you take a testosterone supplement, 
There's FDA warnings on it. Neither the benefits nor the safety of testosterone have been established for low testosterone due to aging. Um, the FDA required that testosterone pharmaceutical labeling warn increased heart attack risk and stroke. So when, when you look at this, look at the, I want you to own the structure, own the location of this, and how a sedentary lifestyle is actually going to weaken those muscles. How poor stool formation, I and mean, when we get a patient in, we say, well, how many bowel movements a day? A day, doc? God, I'm lucky to crap one every other day. Okay. Is, is that common? Do we hear that all the time? Yeah, and, and so if you have poor stool formation, it should be about three times a day. That should be working, okay? Heat, when we're talking about moist heat right on that area, right between the rectum and the base of the penis, moist heat penetrates about two inches. It's going to help blood supply to it. When we talk about, and these, these are the causes of it, Nervous system, prescription drugs, immune system disordered, injury to the prostate. Have you seen the wedgie bikes or bicycles? Do you think that's going to put pressure on the structures in that area? Absolutely. And when we're talking pelvic trauma, dehydration, stress. And so the solutions for a healthy prostate are simpler than you could possibly imagine. Literally get the nervous system checked, exercise regularly, strengthen the immune system, drink plenty of water. And, and that's what the frustrating thing because when you have prostatitis or benign prostatic hypertrophy, you don't want to drink a lot of water because it's a pain to urinate. I mean, literally, physically a pain and it's, it's uncomfortable. However, the water is going to detox your system. Prostate massage. If, if you can't do it yourself, there's, there's machines or, you know, devices that you can do, unless you're flexible like a Cirque du Soleil performer. Or talk to your sweetheart. The sweethearts are really, you know, nice and accommodating. Okay. <laughs> yeah, there, there's, if I'm not red yet. <laughs> okay. And natural anti-inflammatory, okay. moist heat on the peritoneum, warm bath, improved bowel movements, decreased strength. I mean, these are all the solutions. Kegel exercises. If you're not doing the Kegel exercise, you're missing out on everything. A Kegel exercise is when, when you're urinating, the muscles that you tighten up to relax or to, to stop the urine flow. So everybody... Everybody in here, you don't need, don't need, because I know you're going to smile if you do it. Okay, we're going to tighten up the pelvic floor on three. One, two, three. Tighten, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, and then relax. Okay? Easy. Did you do it? <laughs> Good. Just check it. <laughs> I'm not going to, I'm not going to check, okay? <laughs> Okay, but, but when you look at it, okay, tighten it up and hold it for, and we're talking five seconds, ten times a day. This is going to help everything. It's going to help sexual dysfunction. It's going to help with that pelvic floor. It's going to stimulate the muscles. It's going to stimulate the prostate. This is one of the most vital exercises that you could possibly do. And then the, the supplements, vitamin D. Men with prostate cancer are seven times more likely to die if, they're, if they... The less likely if they have normal levels of vitamin D. K2, this is a great supplement. Vitamin K2 decreases prostate cancer by 35%. And, and it's so wild, but results suggest that general dietary modification has a beneficial effect on the prevention of prostate cancer. It does. Don't take any estrogen con containing compounds. I mean, don't drink stuff out of plastic, don't take medications. A healthy diet is eliminating processed sugars, reduced environmental toxin, and sources of heavy metal. So this means no genetically modified foods, no Roundup containing foods, because that destroys, it's a mineral chelator and destroys the natural healthy bacteria. Detox the body, eliminate all packaged foods. The good stuff, animal-based, um, omega-3, selenium, vitamin B, fresh veggie juice daily, broccoli and broccoli sprouts. Walnuts, I mean, it, it, phenomenal, phenomenal. It's so simple and so easy. So when we talk about this and we put up the five things, can you see how important this is for the prostate? Nerve supply, by God, you got to have it. What, what's the mnemonic for that? S, two, four, keeps the what? Ding dong. Off. Ding dong off the floor. Okay, good. God bless you. It works. Okay.
Okay, regular exercise because that's going to move the pelvis and make that pelvic floor work correctly and detox. Proper nutrition, sufficient rest. Now we get a ton, a ton of comments. Prayer and meditation, you religious psycho. Okay, what is the CDC state? Okay, about emotion or emotional states. So does prayer and meditation change your emotional state? Yeah. Yes! CDC, biggest drug pusher on the planet. 85% of all diseases are caused by emotions. Boy, if we only had a drug to regulate emotions. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, up to 90% of doctor's visits in the U.S. may be triggered by stress-related illness. So it is vital. Now, when we look at this, all of this stuff is available on Owner's Guide, but we have, and we're talking one page of reference, two page of reference, three page of reference, um, 70, yeah, 78, 79 references. Okay, put that in your pipe and smoke it. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, now, any questions? From anybody that doesn't have a prostate, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if cholesterol is a little bit higher, that means body needs that higher cholesterol yeah. in the body because it's something fixing. So what you're suggesting is pretty radical. You're saying that the body is smart, I should be writing this down. The body is smart and it's going to change its levels of cholesterol or blood pressure or things to adapt to the environmental stimulus. Because it's fixing something. Because it's fixing something or requires something. Wow, I like that. That would totally screw up the current medical system, but I'm in agreement. <laughs> yeah, I know. It seems too simple. It's, it's like you almost want to whisper it. You know, that yeah, the body's smart. Does anybody know what your, your dog or cat's cholesterol level was this morning? <laughs> no, because they're normal, they're self-regulating. Okay, any other questions? You said that uh, yes. man-made or artificial testosterone is no good. Where yep. do you get the real stuff? Oh, you get the real testosterone from getting healthy adrenal glands, from exercising will stimulate it. Healthy fats will stimulate it. In fact, all the stuff that we talk about here will actually stimulate it. And then in our, in our handout, you're going to look at a tremendous amount of toxins that can decrease it. So if you're drinking water out of a plastic cup, if you're microwaving stuff in a plastic, if you're eating packaged foods with, you know, toxic ingredients, all of that's going to decrease your testosterone levels. And exercise, appropriate nutrients, healthy fats, all increase it. It's, it's almost like, like the, the more you exercise, the more you work out, the more you eat, the more testosterone you produce. I, I know. It's... It, Really, it can't be that simple, but it is. It really is. Yes, sir. The, um, the Kegels exercise is it five times a day. What was it again? Well, if you hold it for about five seconds, and you do about ten of those, and so you're doing, you know, hold it for five seconds, then relax for five seconds. Hold it for five seconds, then relax, and you do ten of those about three or four times a day. Okay. You're going to be amazed because it's kind of like it can can everybody do this. Okay, now can you do this? Now can you do this? Okay, no. Do you know how you do that? You're a lonely teenager <laughs> and you're a Trekkie. No, you do it, you do it by practicing. Okay? Yeah, so, so what would happen if you do those Kegel exercises all the time? You get more control of that area. It's the, the more control of the ejaculation, you're stimulating blood flow, you're getting more control of urination, you get more control of everything. Just think of this. Ha, 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 ha.